All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you everyone for being here today. It's a beautiful day out there. I know you <laughs> guys want to go out, right, and go to the, to the um, evening event. Uh, I guess you guys are stuck here with me for the next two hours, right? So I'm going to try to entertain you guys. Uh, so my name is Klaus. Um, I'm a senior engineering manager in the virtualization team under, uh, in, in RHEL, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Um, I take responsibility for the KVM user space uh, team uh, that I mean, specializes in doing the QMU, libvirt, many other tools around it, a little bit of the KVM. Um, and uh, also would be with us here today, Yash, who is our product owner for, for that same team. But unfortunately, he couldn't be here physically, so I'm, I'm sure he, he, he's with us here in, in, in spirit, right? Uh, he helped me to build this slide. We're going to be talking a little bit about uh, confidential virtualization, confidential computing. But I want to start a little bit with why. Why confidential uh, computing is important. So in a, in a very simple image, I guess it can be summarized, the desire of running your workload privately and securely uh, in someone else's computer. Right, so it's a, it's a little joke that the cloud is just someone else's computer. Um, but it's not limited only to cloud, of course. It's, it's, it's an important property that can be valuable if you have uh, any workload that, is, that you are willing to run in any computer, in any environment that you don't, don't have a complete trust on, right? Um, the, at the end of the day, uh, we believe it will, it will be a, a matter of hygiene, right, if you, if you, if you, if you, uh, if you think about it. Uh, we want to make it as widespread and as easy to use as possible so that uh, whenever you are running workloads in any, any environment where you don't have a complete trust on, uh, you, you're going to be able to have um, technical assurances that this workload is running privately, securely, uh, and it's away from, from the hands of, I mean, even people who are physically uh, able to uh, reach your environment where this, this workload is, is running. Of course, uh, technical assurances is, 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 is a complement to things like auditing and physical security uh, and even legislation, right? We believe that as we scale this, and this, this becomes more popular, uh, the actual requirements for such things, like, such as auditing and, 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 and actual I mean, legislation around where a workload is running, geographically even, can be reduced too. So this is, this is a big motivation of uh, confidential computing in, um, in, in, in summary. Okay? So what exactly do we mean when we, when we talk about confidential computing? The Confidential Computing Consortium defined this by protection of data in use by performing computational in a hardware-based, tested, trusted execution environment. So this is, a, I mean, you need to take a, take a breath before you say all those words in a, in a, in a, single, in a single sentence, right? Uh, the key word that I want to highlight here is data in use. Right? Uh, we, we can address a little bit of the other terms later in the presentation. Uh, we have had protection in, for data in, in at rest or data in transit for decades now. Right? Uh, the, real, the real interesting thing that has been, been happening because of I mean, all those things that we talked in the previous slides uh, are, are how to protect data that is in use in an unsecure environment. Um, and when you think about data in use, there is, I mean, a, a little bit of history behind uh, trying to protect data in use, right? Um, one of the terms that you might heard, and that's, that's a mouthful in itself, is fully homomorphic encryption, or FAE, FHE for short, right? Um, the, the idea about fully homomorphic encryption is that you can keep the inputs secret and the outputs secret and perform computation in a way that the computational engine itself cannot 
or do not need to decrypt and encrypt it. Um, so it, crypt, it keeps things private, right? So it sounds good. The problem with FHE is that it's, it's so new, it's so academic, uh, but I already know that it requires uh, the computing system to be fully aware of how this is being done. So there is a high demand of coordination. There is a high demand of you building your uh, computation uh, to be specifically done uh, in, in such a way for fully homomorphic computing, uh, for, for, for fully homomorphic uh, encryption, right? Uh, so while the inputs and outputs are secret, uh, the environment knows, or uh, the environment needs to know how it is performing that computation, right? Um, and while libraries can help uh, the building that, 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 that application, uh, you need to kind of have that front and center for application as, as, you, as you start developing it. Or if you already have an application, you need to rebuild it from scratch. Um, oh, and by the way, it's 100 to 1,000 times slower than normal computation as well. Okay? <laughs> what about secure multi-party computation? It's also very new and very academic technique where you basically partition the inputs and outputs that are distributed to multiple coordinating parties uh, that therefore won't be able to fully figure out what, uh, what they are all cooperating on. Uh, if it's done right, there's, there are recent protocols that even guarantee how many of those third parties can be compromised before the computation can be compromised. Uh, but similar to FHE, F FHE, it's very recent, very academic, uh, requires you to rebuild the application with that front and center as well. Uh, and even if the inputs and inputs are secret, similar to FHE, the way the protocol uh, works um, needs to be primarily known by all the participants in that uh, cooperation. So it's not very practical, not general enough for um, to talk about um, uh, it in implementation in real world, not, not at least uh, uh, today, right? So while those two uh, techniques, they do provide data confidentiality, they're not practical, uh, they're not sufficiently general, uh, and uh, one other interesting property that we discussed is that they require the environment running those applications to be um, willingly uh, executing that workload uh, in a correct way, right? Um, there are no data integrity protections. There are no ways that you can guarantee that those, those cooperating parties are doing it right. So how can we solve this? Uh, let's go back to the definition, right? Confidential computing, protection of data in use, performing computation on a harder based a tested trust execution environment. So, to the despair of our purist mathematicians and to the academia, right, we are brute forcing it with hardware, right? We, we, we are introducing I mean, a piece of hardware uh, that will allow us to do this, uh, not only um, do this, um, the, the, the computation of private workloads as, as we discussed in the previous slides, but in a way that it can be verified for integrity as well, right? So introducing trust execution environments. Um, we, we wanna break that down into basically two concepts, right? So the harder component that I just mentioned, uh, we, we are adding to CPU, or actually we already did add to CPUs especially, uh, special instructions that can provide what we call a hardware root of trust. That essentially means that, I mean, if you trust the hardware vendor enough, they are making promises that um, when you propose yourself to do a TE, that they will do the right thing. They will provide um, a hardware-based cryptographic environment where not only your memory is encrypted uh, during, during, re, during use, not a fully homomorphic encryption, but I mean, there will be a sufficient number of protections in the hardware, in the CPU, that will allow that data to be encrypted in memory um, and decrypted real time when it is about to be used by the processor and also additional um, um, safeguards so that 
Uh, we don't inspect the data, for example, in their registers inside the CPU, right? Or that we, can, we cannot influence how that is done as well, right? Uh, but don't, we, don't, we don't stop there. Uh, the, an additional responsibility of the hardware root of trust is also to perform something called attestation which is in practice a remote attestation for most of the use cases, right? So in addition for us to actually have um, uh, a way to, 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 to run workloads in an encrypted environment, we also have a ways to show proof to the external world that that, uh, that, that environment is not running, uh, is, is not only running in an encrypted environment, but is, is running exactly to the parameters that you want to and exactly the code, the, 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 the things that you want to run as well. Um, again, this is part of the hardware brute force that I, that I just mentioned. Uh, in practice, this is accomplished by, I mean, a lot of cryptography that is real time and, and going back and forth into and out of the processor, but also uh, a hardware signing key that cannot be modified, cannot be inspected, is a private key that is uh, owned by the manufacturer, by the, the, the CPU manufactured, and will be able to identify such environments for anyone possessing a public key that want to validate those environments, right? So if we go back to the other two options and we compare them, um, the advantages of the confidential computing are very clear, right? We can run pretty much any general workload in there. There's no, no need for you to uh, rebuild, rethink, re-architecture your software. Uh, we can provide confidentiality of your workload. There's no need for the environment to know how you are performing that computation. There's no need for cooperation, collaboration, right? Um, and we, we also can provide attestation. We can also provide um, a way to guarantee the integrity of what you're running in the way you want it to be run, okay? So now it's the interesting part, how, how, we, are, how we are doing this. And before that, a small disclaimer. Um, we're gonna, from this point on, talk a little more, uh, talk exclusively about the, 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 the architecture that we are doing for Intel, and uh, specifically Intel TDX, trusted domain executions, right? Uh, and for AMD SEV SNP, uh, that's a mouthful too. It's secure environment, um, secure encrypted. encrypted virtual, right? And secure net nested paging SNP. So those are the names that the CPU manufacturers created for, for this on x86. Uh, IBM does have, I mean, a few options of them themselves. One of them is IBM Z Secure uh, uh, ARM is has at least well specified at this moment the ARM CCA. Uh, so we believe that, I mean, there, there's enough evidence that this is hot enough to unite all of the companies or harder companies in actually pursuing this, okay? So this is a completely untrusted environment, right? In a completely untrusted environment, I mean, you, you have an untrusted VM, of course, and malicious actors or attacks, exploits, they can actually come from any, pretty much any direction, right? Uh, locally, um, sysadmins trying to, I mean, um, uh, willingly or unwillingly um, inspect or, or disrupt your environment. Uh, something that you carefully crafted in storage, and even rogue devices. Even rogue devices could be um, exploited or intentionally or not intentionally to actually attack your workload, right? Um, in, as, as we mentioned before, in, in a TE-capable environment, we have this piece of hardware uh, called, I mean, the hardware root of trust that we, I mean, consider to be trusted already because we trust the, the hardware manufacturer. We also need to have um, an already secure location, an already secure environment that we can use to, in practice, extend trust to that environment, right? Uh, in that already secure environment, we place an attestation server that will be ultimately responsible for validating that your server, your, your TE, is actually running uh, the thing that you want to run. Um, that can ultimately be your laptop, right? More, more practically, 
Uh, we believe that that is going to be, I mean, a service in your infrastructure, something that you already have, I mean, controls on, and you will be comfortable in extending that trust to servers or to uh, environments that are outside of your control. The, the, for, for, for the TEs that we are looking at here uh, for Intel and AMD, uh, they are accomplished in practice, again, through a virtual machine, right? Uh, what it means is that there, there will be special, there are special instructions that when, once they start the, uh, the, the confidential, the, the VM, not yet confidential, but uh, potentially confidential, when it starts the confidential, it's, it's uh, a VM, it's, it's able to um, attest, it's able to uh, isolate it from the surrounding environment, but also the ability to uh, verify what has been run in that VM up to a point of a starting attestation uh, and showing that as proof to a third party or to a trusted third party, in this case, the uh, attestation server, right? So this is done essentially through an agent that is inside the, uh, the, the confidential VM. Uh, the VM starts normally. Um, it's, it's very, I mean, it's very compatible. Yes, there are code that needs to be uh, present in both host and guest for this to be possible. Uh, but pretty much everything else is, is pretty, pretty much standard. Uh, we start a virtual firmware. We start a guest kernel, and then we start an, attest uh, an attestation client. That attestation client, uh, once it is requested, I mean, once, once it, it comes up, it can request the hardware root of trust for an attestation report. Uh, that attestation report is built exclusively by the hardware root of trust with no interference of the, I mean, of the environment itself, not a, uh, and, and not a, uh, anything that the host can influence on. Uh, that attestation report is signed by the, the hardware key, and then uh, it is communicated back to the uh, attestation server, excuse me. <coughs> the communication to the attestation server does, doesn't actually need to be encrypted, if you think about it. I mean, you can do it. Um, we, we, we might want to do it even, but it doesn't need to be uh, encrypted in, in itself. As long as it's signed, you are, provide, you are providing, I mean, public evidence that, is, that can be inspected by pretty much anyone in, into the uh, uh, environment that, hey, this is, this is what this server is running, this instance is running, right? And he, the, here's the key that there is a guarantee that there is a trust execution environment capable processor that is telling you how, uh, how uh, this environment is, is being run, right? Um, the, the attestation server could be part, or what attestation server we are contacting can be part of, um, of, of the measurement of the attestation report that we are providing. So this could be part of the configuration that we consider to be essential for us to tr start trusting this server so that it doesn't communicate with any uh, at the station server. And in that configuration, there could be a, pre, a set of pre-shared keys as well, uh, so that we, we, we know that we are talking to the right entity uh, always, right? Both in, in forward and reverse direction, right? So what does the attestation server do? Um, it will validate the evidence that you are giving to, to it um, for integrity. Uh, this is in practice done by measuring the, uh, the components that are uh, being run up to that point of the uh, attestation report request. Uh, it will put that in a packet to the attestation report sent to the attestation server. The attestation server will, will, will try to match it with their own idea of what should be running. And if it's a match, uh, what happens is that the attestation server starts trusting that environment to the point of sharing additional secrets with that environment. Okay, again, again, I mean, all very uh, well encrypted and protected because we, we are focusing on the encryption of uh, data in use here, but of course this is all being surrounded by encryption of data at rest and encryption of data in transit as well, right? Uh, with that key or secret, 
um, the, the confidential VM or the trusted execution environment can actually evolve or can actually progress to the next stage, which is using that key to, for example, decrypt local storage that is available uh, to them that, I mean, only that key will, 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 uh, will be able to decrypt. Uh, and decrypting that, we will also be able to guarantee its integrity, right? I mean, it's, it's the thing that is, I mean, it's, it's not a, it's not a, um, it's not anyone trying to impersonate that, it's the real thing. Um, we, can, we can use that secret to actually contact uh, other devices. We can use that key or to, to actually start expanding that trust execution environment as well. We can repeat that entire process if we really want to uh, validate that external devices are to be trusted, like uh, requesting them to use their own hardware root of trust to identify themselves as well. <coughs> now let's make a stop. <laughs> I want to address, I mean, um, um, some, some elephant in the room, because much of what we've seen here is um, what's already available for bare metal servers um, uh, in, uh, through, I mean, something that we call, I mean, a TPM, a trusted execution, uh, a trusted computing environment, right? Um, what, what, it, what is happening with confidential computing is that we are bringing many of the techniques and many of the um, good things from, from, uh, from that era of trusted computing to a virtualized environment where we can have not only a single hardware root of trust, but we can actually have a dynamic hardware root of trust, something that can be dynamically provisioned, right? Uh, appropriate for, again, cloud environments, appropriate for uh, running your computation in someone else's computer, right? Um, but you, as you will see in the next slides, I mean, we, we are still insisting with TPMs, and we are still insisting with trusted computing technology. So why, why is that, right? Um, in the confidential, or, or in the VM world, in the hypervisor business, uh, being simple and being compatible are sometimes opposing concepts, right? Um, if you are bringing a VM where its sole purpose is to run a container, uh, and you, you, you control, you, you vendor, you are the, the, the vendor for the actual kernel, for the actual operating system that is running inside a TE, a confidential VM, and, and its sole purpose is to bring a container that is your container, I mean, the, 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 the customer's containers, uh, on top of it, uh, we can make it very simple, following what in the, the, the diagram that we just shown. And, and it's basically that on the left side here, right? Uh, a, virtual, a virtual firmware guest and attestation agent, and then we bring up containers on top of this. Things starts to be a little more complicated if we are thinking about compatibility, right? If we're thinking about compatibility, there's a lot of um, legacy, or I wouldn't, I wouldn't use a derogatory term of legacy. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of uh, good uh, solutions out there for, for, uh, that customers are already using that are based on trusted computing techniques. Um, and there are some customers who are very keen on not only validating the integrity of their systems at boot time when the, when the virtual machines comes up, but they also want to keep validating it at runtime because those VMs can live forever, right? I mean, if you, if you don't have, if you have a virtual environment that you don't need to perform hardware maintenance underneath, or in fact, if you went to the virtualized environment because you don't want to do any uh, downtimes or anything that disrupts it with, uh, modifying the, the uh, faster aging hardware infrastructure that is beneath it, uh, you want to stay compatible with them for a long time. And that's why in the right hand, we, we have a model of bringing back the virtual, uh, uh, the, the TPM in a virtualized way, the trusted platform module in a, virtu uh, in a virtualized way. This will be important for compatibility with other OSs, such as Windows, BSDs, and even other distros as well. Uh, but this will be also super important for those customers who want to continue to perform uh, uh, attestation 
I want to continue to perform validation of the integrity of the running system because we have a lot of already established techniques and software to do that through, for example, the Linux integrity measurement architecture and through Keyline, the, I mean, uh, the, the entity that performs that. Um, there's always the possibility of us to do a hybrid, right? So the community also came up with a proposal to use TPMs, but yeah, let's not uh, worry about their state. Uh, because, I mean, uh, we, we are still thinking about that case where um, some workload will come up, we execute an, uh, uh, um, uh, a workload for some time. We want to do, we want to perform uh, uh, integrity measurements, we, we want to perform integrity validations uh, across the life cycle of that VM. Uh, but, I mean, it doesn't really matter when, when it shuts down and then we can start all over again, right? So for that, it's, it's the middle column that we call a stateless uh, a confidential VM, which is essentially has a VTPM as well, but um, not, not something that we care about the state, right? No, so, so now that we've gone through the uh, confidential computing how or, or, or the mechanics of it, let me go through a few of the projects that are actually collaborating for this environment to grow. The first one is obviously the Linux kernel, right? And I think it's the third time that I say this, that I, we, we, we are close, but we are not there yet. <laughs> so there are patches for both Intel as well as AMD. They are still flying, are still um, um, in, uh, in the air. Uh, for, for, for being merged into the Linux kernel. Uh, they're not quite there yet. A big portion of the AMD stuff was merged in the last release. Um, we expect the Intel patches to be catching up uh, from, from, uh, from now to the end of the year. Um, and once those patches are solid in the kernel, uh, there will be a cascading number of other patches that are also flying around, that are also uh, being worked already or have been worked for the last year or so for QEMU and for Libvirt and um, a plethora of other smaller projects that, that are part of the ecosystem as well. So if you're really interest, interested or if you really want to help, there are opportunities. Uh, we are always looking for reviewers. We are always looking for feedback in all of those three projects. Now, when, when I mentioned VTPM, uh, in a few slides back, um, we, need, we need an environment that is part of the firmware so that uh, VTPM can run on. So this is Coconut SVSM. Coconut SVSM is a project that was originated by Jorg from, from SUSE, uh, and SVSM stands for Secure Virtual Service Machine. Uh, so it's basically an entity that lives before the kernel, the Linux kernel, uh, comes up, but it's able to actually run a few services, a few secure services, such as the VTPM. Uh, and and um, it's, it's in open development right now. Uh, a lot of movement, a lot of, um, a lot of traffic going on in the mailing list. Um, and we are welcoming any help in, in SVSM as well. I, wanna, I also want to give a shout out to Keylime and VertT, uh, because Keylime is the project that we are uh, instrumentalizing, we are modifying so that it can be an attestation server, in addition to the functions that, the, that Keylime is already performing for runtime integrity measurements. Uh, we also want to enable it to be able to unlock uh, a confidential VM as well. And VertT is where we are trying to put most of the common code that is necessary to all of the different environments. So when we have that figure of three different models, uh, we are not being too crazy of actually creating two completely separate infrastructures. We are trying to make uh, the most use of common code, and VertT is a big component of that too. I also want to give a shout out to Confidential Containers. So this is one of the hottest projects that there is. Uh, containers is obviously one of the first, most, most obvious um, applications for uh, confidential, for, for TEEs. Um, we, 
we have a big team working not only on, on, on Red Hat, but on Microsoft and on Intel, um, Alibaba. So there, there, there is a big interest of uh, people across the community. Uh, and it's basically Kata, so Kata containers, but instead of running on just, I mean, uh, a normal uh, VM, it is actually running on a confidential VM. And for that, there is a plethora of uh, sub-projects as well surrounding it, like attestation servers and agents uh, that uh, are important in this, in this uh, scenario as well. And, and lastly, I want to point out to the, the hotness of the topic, right? So if you're not satisfied with my, and you should not be satisfied with my talk today, uh, please, I mean, go ahead and find how much and how often this has been talked uh, in, in, in any, I mean, uh, any conference uh, that talks about systems development that is worth their salt, right? Uh, so, so we have a confidential computing consortium. They have their own set of conferences. Uh, we have, uh, this is a major topic in, in, in past KVM forums in the future. And the next month's KVM forum in Brno, we will be talking about it again. Uh, this will be a topic on the Linux plumbers with uh, microconference. Uh, there are firmware conference that are addressing this all the time. Um, and and I'll, I'll welcome you. I'll, I'll, I'll give a, a big incentive for you to actually go find out more. Uh, with that, that's my thank you for, for your attention. Questions? Do you have one? Um, I was wondering where the um, the attestation agent is that. Uh, what layer is that implemented? Maybe more than one. Is that like in the virtual EFI firmware of the VM? Is it uh, in the init RD? Um, where does that fit in? Can you guess the answer? It depends, right? right. <laughs> it depends, right? So. Uh, in the simple uh, confidential VM mode, um, we are actually running it as part of, I mean, the, the, the operating system. It's not even part of the initRD so far. Because on the simple mode, um, it is a very stable environment, right? So we, we control the, the kernel, we control the first few steps of, I mean, the VM that is coming up with the sole purpose of actually running a confidential uh, workload on top of it. Uh, so we can, we can take our time. We can do that late in the boot uh, sequence. Um, there are ways you can do that as part of initRD. There are ways you can actually do that even after initRD is, is done with its work, right? Uh, on the right is where we are having the confidential, the, the attestation client as part of the firmware, right? Because the idea here is to actually isolate the confidential VM from even needing to care about attestation clients and attestation servers, right? Uh, otherwise, what we would see is that, I mean, for Windows, you'll have an attestation client. For Fedora, you'll have one. For RHEL, you'll have another. For Ubuntu and for BSD, I mean, uh, every, there, there will be um, uh, uh, too many things to track and too many things that are super, confident, super uh, uh, security uh, related, right? So. We opted to bring that to the firmware level. And what it actually do is that it attests uh, up to that point, uh, up to that firmware level point that the environment is secure. And then with that, the secret that comes back from the attestation server, we actually unlock a state, a state that will be injected into the virtual TPM. From that point on, I mean, it's already considered trusted up to that point. And with the state that is injected into the TPM, it's not our state. It's the customer state that was previously either manufactured or provided by the customer itself. So for example, uh, we can perform then secure boot to make sure that we are loading the, the correct kernel. We can perf perform even measured boot to make, make sure that we are loading the correct kernel, and we are collecting measure, measurements as well. Uh, once the correct kernel is loaded, uh, that correct kernel can also look at the state for the TPMs to unseal the 
the, the primary storage, the root disk, right? So it works very well and it's very compatible. It adds a complication of um, performing attestation uh, from, from an environment that doesn't even have a network stack yet, the firmware, and we don't want to have a network stack there. But there are solutions. Uh, what we have today is that uh, there is a proxy in the, um, uh, in the host that it doesn't need to be trusted. It's just, I mean, passing messages along, messages that they themselves cannot decrypt or can, can figure out what they are. Uh, but, I mean, it has a network stack in the, in the host, and then we use something like VSOC or even direct memory mapping to uh, pass on the attestation report from the firmware up to the host and up to the host in the proxy and then uh, to the server and on, on its way back. Other questions? All right. All right. So doesn't look like there's any questions. Thank you so much for this talk, Klaus. This is very um, informative about all things confidential computing, and I'm sure that after this talk, everyone's going to be talking about it. So thank, thank you. you very much.